Greetings and welcome to chapter 16, Domestic Policy. So as we have seen throughout this course, we have seen how our government is structured through the Constitution. We have seen how government is conducted, how it's run, specifically how legislation is made. We've seen how what impacts voter turnout and how um, our votes, how, how that determines policy. And we've taken a look at what has influenced policy, political parties, etc. So what we're going to do now is take a look at output of government, right? So let's dive into this. We're going to be looking at in this lecture, uh, what is public policy? We're going to take a look at economics, American theories in economics, and government spending. So without any further delay, let's begin. Okay, so public policy, by definition, is the broad strategy government uses to do its job, the relatively stable set of purposive governmental behaviors that address matters of concern to some part of society. So this is public policy, right? So what exactly is it? It's basically every political issue that we can think of, right? Um, public policy is so broad, right? It is the strategy that government uses to do its job. Well, what issues are, are, are facing our government today? What strategies is it going to use to address those concerns, right? And this, there's a host of things to talk about here, right? Everything from, we have a situation if we have a situation with a foreign nation, right? Let's take uh, Ukraine, for example. Why would the United States want to send money or send supplies or send military equipment to a country like Ukraine? Well, for various reasons. There is a problem that is regional destabilability. We have a democracy that's being invaded by a foreign force that wants to take it over. So we have an ally, in fact, that's a democracy. Uh, we have also the destabilization of Europe as a whole. So as a way for us to address that without going into a direct war, right, we send resources. We send military supplies. We send um, um, uh, um, foreign aid, military aid. And all of that is the, is the strategy to take care of or to address this issue, right? So public policy, as I said just a moment ago, it contains every political issue. Everything is, every political issue that, that you can think of, it's public policy in the end, right? These are issues that that we are trying to deal with, that government is trying to deal with, and public policy is a strategy for addressing those issues, right? So some examples within public policy, just to name just, <laughs> just a few here, right? We have uh, euthanasia, uh, abortion, federal budget and spending, healthcare reform, immigration, same-sex marriages, gun control, um, <laughs> election uh, laws. The voting age, shouldn't the voting age be lowered um, to 16, right? Uh, what else is that? I mean, um, climate change, um, all, these, all these other issues that you can think of, in the end, is public policy. So public policy, just to recap one more time, it is the broad strategy for which we use, which government uses, to not only do its job, but to address these issues. And these issues that some people have, right? And that's 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 the reason why voting is so important. Um, I know I've, I've I've talked about this before, the importance of voting before, but I just gotta hammer this one more time. And we can put it in the context of public policy. Have you ever wondered why Congress and why the president seems to pass legislation? and address concerns and issues that a older population 
who has, right? These concerns that maybe an older population, they're not really aimed, right? Take a look at the rhetoric, take a look at the issues they bring up. And this is historically, just, just take a look at what, how a president talks, what issues a president talks about. Take a look at what Congress has done, right? Take a look at all this. Take a look at the legislation that's actually passed. And it seems to aim at a certain group of people that's under the age of, I don't know, 50. There's a reason for that. And think back to our previous lectures about voter turnout and what influences voter turnout. Age. Younger people typically do not vote. And if they don't vote and they're not voicing their concerns and if they're not being vocal, then public policy, the output of government, is going to match those who are louder, those who actually do vote. Why? Because congressional members, they are running and they are listening to those who vote. It's hard to imagine, right, to listen to every constituent. And every constituent, by the way, is extremely important. I don't care the age. I don't care if we're talking voting age or not, right? Everyone, every constituent is extremely important. But it's hard to have a mandate from the constituents. It's hard to imagine what, all, what, what would benefit all of the constituents if only those who are older vote. And, and you might think, well, you know, Professor Patterson, we had a large, voter, uh, large youth voter turnout in a previous election or two. And you might be right about that. But here's the key. Historically speaking, see, the youth needs to vote consistently for a long period of time, not just one or two special elections or one or two historical elections. This needs to be a consistent, methodical, uh, every election, they are consistent because older people vote. So I, I'm getting on a tangent, and I'm sorry, but this is important to highlight that public policy will address issues and concerns of though of a particular group and that particular group are those who are loud and vocal donate money and vote to campaign you know vote for political parties vote for particular candidates they go they go out and vote when it's election day so i'm i'm i don't mean to uh digress here but it's important to note Going back to the to definition, right, to address members of, uh, you know, to address matters of concern to some part of society. That is those who vote. <laughs> so I just want to say this one more time. It's extremely important for all to vote. Because after all, it's not just the youth. It's not just those who are older. It's all of us. We as a whole make up the population. We as a whole make up the nation. So yeah, we need to be politically active if we want to, see, and, and by the way, not just once, not just twice, but consistently politically active. If we want to see government output or the output of government matching our concerns or the majority concerns. So yeah, voting, it's important. <laughs> I'm digressing. Let's move on. So types of goods that exist in public policy, right? We have private goods. These are goods owned by a particular person or group of people and are, and are excluded from use by others, typically by means of a price, right? So uh, this could be a private uh, property. This could be a business. This could be a home, right? Um. So these are examples of private goods. Uh, public goods. These are goods that are not excludable and are infinite since no one owns them. Right. So some examples. Forest. It might be a debatable. You know, we might be able to run out of forests if we cut them all down. But in general, you know, we think of forests. We think of water. We think of air. Right. These are public goods that are infinite. Right. 
Uh, and then we have toll goods. Uh, we are pretty familiar with this concept, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> These are goods open to all and theoretically infinite if maintained, but they are paid for or provided by some uh, outside non-governmental entity. So look no further than the toll roads. Look no further than the beltways. Yes, these are, uh, yeah, <laughs> these are toll roads. These are tolls. Uh, a government, a non-government agency looks over it or, or, or that we pay for it, right? And every time we use that tollway, we are paying for that ability to use it, right? So yeah, we're pretty familiar with this. So types of public policy, right? We have uh, distributive policy. This is a policy that collects payments or resources broadly, uh, but concentrates direct benefits on relatively few. So an example of this would be the uh, Hoover Dam, right? Other types include redistributive policy. Now this type of policy gets, we hear about debates surrounding this concept frequently, right? So redistributive policy is a policy in which costs are borne by a relatively small number or a small number of groups or individuals but benefits are expected to be enjoyed by a different group in society, right? So um, we can often, we often put it in the context, right, of, we can even put this in the, in the context of political parties, right? The idea that, um, that those who are rich should pay the fair share of taxes, and when they do that, right, um, Congress, through its ability to collect taxes and to, um, redistribute, or shall I say, appropriate funding as they deem fit, as granted to them by the U.S. Constitution. They, as they appropriate these funds, um, so we have a small group. These are the, uh, you know, the rich, and it's being used for programs like Medicaid, food stamps, or SNAP, and Pell grants. Right? These, these public goods or services for the public, while everyone technically pays into it, this idea that you know, um, those who make more pay more in taxes, because that's how it works, right? The more money you make, the more taxes, you know, the higher on the tax bracket you are, the more money that you pay. So uh, we can see a form of this redistributive policy even in American politics. And it's not fair <laughs> to call this socialism it's it's not. Now you may agree with it. We may disagree with it. Absolutely, but these services, they, you know, for example, the Pell grants, these are eligible. Anyone and everyone's eligible for them, assuming you you meet a certain threshold with a uh, with with what's known as the EFC, right? Um, there's not exactly like uh, so. The point I'm trying to get at with this. And, and, I'm, and I'm going off on a tangent, my apologies. But what I'm trying to get at here is that redistributive policy does not mean all of a sudden socialism. That's what I'm trying to get at. Let's move on. Continuing on with these types of public policy, we have regulatory policy. That is a policy that regulates companies and organizations in a way that protects the public. Right? So, We've we've talked about how important government is, right? We we've talked about how important it is for us to vote. Government serves a function for us, right? And I, sometimes I wonder if we lose sight of that function, because it seems like as time progresses, it seems like we are losing more trust and faith in government. Now, is that because of our high levels of political polarization? Is that because of uh, part of, uh, you know, um, you know, bias and partisan media that we obtain? And whatever the reason for that, we're seeming to lose some faith and trust in our government. And we need to remember that government does serve important functions, such as public safety. 
not only in the context of, you know, uh, civil liberties and civil rights, but also more practically, like uh, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. They regulate the safety of food, pharmaceuticals, and other consumer products. Our groceries, the grocery store, the standards that government sets for uh, restaurant health, all these things. Um, if it was left up to individuals and if it was left up to businesses to regulate themselves and not have the oversight of the government, well, businesses are only there to make money. So if it's cheaper to do something to cut some corners, then most likely would do it if government regulation wasn't there. Now, is that to say that all government regulation is fantastic and phenomenal and that we need to have more and more and more? You know what? That's up to you and I uh, with our own ideology to be able to, an to answer that question. You know? But the point here is that government does solve a function. Right? Uh, another function, uh, we go in public safety real quick, speed limits. Uh, I mean, true, we usually break speed limits anyways, but would we, if the posted speed limit was 75, would you go, I mean, there's a difference, right? If the posted speed limit is 35 compared to 60, or 75, right? Our speeding changes, right? So the regulation for public safety, that's a function of government. I'm digressing. Right? So again, the FDA, uh, how it regulates food safety, how it regulates pharmaceuticals, other consumer products. This is a, this is a uh, type of public policy that benefits all. And again, it's a function of government. So let's dive into a, to a, um, econ economics, right? So free market economics. This is a school of thought that believes the forces of supply and demand working without any government intervention are the most effective way for markets to operate, right? So no, so let's, let's break this down just, just, just a little bit here, right? without any government intervention. Now, one way we can think about Democrats and Republicans, right, is that Democrats, they advocate for, or not even just Democrats, uh, those who prescribe a liberal philosophy regarding, or ideolog uh, ideology regarding the economy, because you can still have uh, liberal, Demo uh, liberal Democrats and liberal Republicans, conservative Republicans and conservative Democrats. These do exist. Uh, one may hold social values as a conservative, but when it comes to the economy, they don't mind some intervention. So let's dive into this, this thought. Right? So when we think of government intervention, right, uh, we often think of uh, liberals or Democrats advocating for government to act. There's a problem, like in the context of the economy, there's a problem with the economy, i.e. Uh, GM is, got, is about to go under. They're about to file for bankruptcy. Those who prescribe to a, a liberal philosophy when it comes to the economy would argue, okay, we have to have a government intervention. We need to potentially uh, uh, buy out or, um, what's the word? I hate when this happens, uh, you know, a word comes to mind and it's like on the tip of my tongue. Bail out. Thank you. Thank you. Bail out. But that, um, that the federal government should bail out GM like we've done. Um, that's a intervention rather than, rather than no intervention and just letting the economy do its thing. If GM is going to go on because it has a bad product or whatever the case may be, then so be it. The market will eat it up. Right? So... The idea of government intervention here right, is to prevent GM from falling, from being eaten up by the market. Now, what good is it for government to do that? Well, GM is a huge employer. A significant amount of jobs were, going to be, were, were going to be lost. So the government stepped in and bailed them out. 
under the Obama administration. Now, whether or not we agree with that necessarily or not, you know, again, that's up to ideology. But the point here is that when we talk about free market um, economics, we're talking about no government intervention. Let the market do its thing. Right? But as we mentioned just a moment ago, some regulation may be needed to ensure no funny business is going on. Now, should it be re heavily regulated? Again, that's up to ideology. But we can understand and, and understand that there's a potential need for at least some. But what do you think? What do you think? Do you think the government should be completely hands off? Do you think government should have a light touch and have some regulation? Or do you think the economy should be heavily regulated? You let me know. Core principles of free economics or free market economics, right? That the marketplace is the most efficient means to exchange private goods. We, we, took, we looked at what that definition of a private good was. Right? The government doesn't have a need to protect the value of private goods under these core principles of free market economics. So there are some problems though with free market economics. Not all goods can be classified as private, such as air, bodies of water, and the migration of birds, for example. Right? Some goods are too expensive or too large for the private, uh, for for the entire private market, I should say, such as building and maintaining highways, providing law enforcement, and building schools. Right? So we have government steps in to address these concerns. Right? Schools, especially here in Texas, the uh, schools are ISD, especially if we're talking about you know the um, the uh, grade schools, right? K through twelve. But those are ISDs. That's a government. That's a form of local government that the Texas legislature <laughs> creates. So, um, government tries to address these issues. But and again, even though the government is addressing this, and even though um, it might violate some free market principles, we still have a free economy, right? We we still do. Let's move on. Laissez-faire, right? Uh, hands off, right? That's what we're talking about when we talk about laissez-faire. This idea of completely hands-off government, no intervention, right? An economic policy that assumes the key to economic growth and development is for the government to allow private markets to operate effectively without any type of interference. Hands-off approach, right? But again, you know, this discussion of of if there was no regulation whatsoever, right? This is just this is just a critical question to ask. This isn't ideologically pointed or anything like that, or politically motivated. It's just it's just a a critical question to ask you, right? If there was no regulation, if the government was truly hands off, would we see an increase in abuse? Right. Will we see an increase of uh, manipulation and of um, nefarious, you know, motive motives? Right. So to answer to 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 dive into that discussion, we need to identify our ideology. We need to identify how we view how much government intervention, if any. Uh, you and I agree with. And that all comes down to how we view the economy, how we view government as a whole, right? Should Can government be trusted enough? I mean, after all, they're elected every two years by you and I. Can they be trusted enough to regulate with a, with a healthy hand rather than with an iron hand, if that makes sense, right? It all comes down to ideology. But when we do talk about the economy, right, there are two schools of thought here 
in the United States that we can we can almost view it in terms of political parties. So let's let's take a look at this. All right. So some American theories here. We're going to take a look at two. Keynesian economics, and then we're going to be taking a look at supply side economics. So bear with me. Keynesian economics is an economic policy based on the idea that economic growth is closely tied to the ability of individuals to consume goods. But uh, Democrats are more likely to support Keynesian theories. Now, this is not an absolute, by the way. Right. Uh, this is not an absolute that you're going to that all Democrats think like that. No. But in general, you know, in, in the grand scheme, if we were to uh, the, the majority, if you will, are more likely to support Keynesian theories. So this idea then like, and you can almost see that with how the de how Democrats think and how Democrats operate in the context of wanting to provide public goods, right? And, or not public goods, but to provide, to be able to help people pull themselves up by the bootstraps, right? To be able to give them the bootstraps to pull up, right? Uh, this idea that, that the economy is healthy, we'll see economic growth based on our ability, your ability, my ability to consume goods, to purchase goods, to buy products, to, um, to be able to do that, right? So we will find economic growth as long as people, and the more people you have, uh, as long as we have people consuming goods, and the more people you have assume, uh, consuming goods, the better your economy is going to be, right? So you can, you can, you, you can, you can hear it this the Keynesian theories being put into the Democrats' uh, rhetoric, if you will, right? The idea that uh, not all of us have bootstraps to pull up, so let's give bootstraps to everyone so they can pull themselves up, right? The, that idea, right? That's that's a Keynesian approach. Meanwhile, we have supply side economics which is an economic policy that assumes economic growth is a largely a function of the country's productive capacity, right? So, again, it's, this is not an absolute, but more often than not, Republicans are more likely to support supply-side theories of economics compared to uh, Keynesian, for example. So this idea then, and again, you can hear this. You, you can hear this within the Republican Party, right? You can hear this coming from the rhetoric, this idea that uh, we all have bootstraps and as long as we are producing, as long as we are moving on, as long as we are pulling ourselves up, we're going to be good, right? So you can hear that rhetoric. And it's interesting to note all this. But for, for us today, I just want us to focus on this idea that Republicans are more likely to support supply side. Democrats are more likely to support Keynesian theories. Now, again, this is not an absolute statement, but in general, they are more likely. I'm digressing. Let's move on. So entitlement programs, right? An entitlement program is a program that generates or guarantees, I should say, guarantees benefits to members of a specific group or segment of the population. So an example of entitlement would be Social Security, right? Because it been, because um, a specific group that those who are reach a certain age, who has worked a certain amount of time, uh, that they, this segment, this group of the population, uh, gets this program, right? The Social Security benefits. A safety net is a way to provide for members of society experiencing economic hardships. And by the way, economic hardships come in many, 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 many different ways, in different forms, for that matter. Uh, some are self-induced. In other words, we put ourselves into that position. And some of them are no fault to our own. Right? No fault of our own. So, so, 
safety nets work on two fronts. Right? First is individual families. Right? This idea that uh, families who are experiencing hardships, uh, and again, some of it is not to their own fault whatsoever. These safety nets help them to, to sustain themselves. For example, um, the, our textbook talks about this, this idea of between eating and starving, that safety nets help to prevent uh, individual families from starving. And I would, I would, I would like to say that this is uh, safety nets are good, right? Because it because it helps people. What is government? <laughs> what is government uh, without its people, right? So, uh, and then the other side, uh, the the other front here with safety nets, is the idea that. Um, it helps the economy because overall, um, it, safety nets prevent the economy from sliding from a recession to a very deep depression. Right? So, critical. Let's move on. Types of entitlement programs that exist. We have Medicaid. And this, this is a health insurance program for low-income citizens. We have Medicare an entitlement health health insurance program for older people and retirees who no longer get health insurance through the work and social security right? a welfare uh, a social welfare policy for people who no longer receive an income from employment and there are, there are certain criteria you have to meet in order to get social security but again those are uh, determined by Congress and the government. So, what ch my question for you right, is: What challenges do policymakers and the public face today with these programs? Let me know your thoughts on that. Right? Let me know. So, let's dive into government spending, right? So, there are two types of spending expenditures. <laughs> two types of government spending that we're going to be talking about. The first is discretionary spending. Okay, This is government spending that Congress must pass legislation to authorize each year. Okay, that's, So that's what we mean by discretionary spending here. Government spending that Congress must pass legislation to authorize each year. Examples of this, military spending, education spending, Spending for national parks. So this is what's as these are examples of this discretionary spending. Mandatory spending, the other one that we will, that we're going to talk about, is government spending earmarked for entitlement programs, guaranteeing support to those who meet certain qualifications. Again, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, these are all examples of mandatory spending. So let's dive into deficits and, de and debt. Okay, Because our national debt, whoo, <laughs> it's climbing. It's, it's way high. So let's talk about this. Deficits. This is the annual amount by which expenditures are greater than revenues. In other words, government is spending way more than its income. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's just that simple. A deficit is government spending more money than it's bringing in. And now, uh, we can say it like this. Um, Government is spending more than it's taxing, more than it's collecting in taxes. But um, one of the analogies I like to use when we talk about deficits and spending is health, particularly weight, right? Um, like, for example, if, if I'm trying to lose weight, right, uh, I have a couple of methods that I can use. I can cut my calorie intake. In other words, I can cut my spending, right? 
or I can exercise, which is the equivalent of um, raising taxes, or if I'm in a really bad position and I want to lose a lot of weight, then do both, right? Exercise and cut my calories. Well, in terms of our deficit spending, the analogy goes as far as to say that uh, we need to then raise taxes and cut spending. Right. It's, it's, it's an analogy and it's still, it's still a work in progress but it makes some sense it helps us to understand uh, these you know, deficits in, in a practical way right. the, uh, so a debt the, the debt is the total amount of government owes across all years so yeah so what steps should policymakers and the public take to address the ever growing national debt if any steps we should take this is a question I have for you. And as we think about this, I just want to throw this out there real quick, that we, maybe the government needs to ensure that everyone, regardless of status, regardless of um, political party, you know, we forget all that, regardless of status, that everyone is paying their share of the taxes. Maybe. Maybe another approach is to just cut our spending. Right? Uh, how much? How much of our budget are we are we um, putting into you know? Well, not 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 necessarily how much, but how is our money being used, and is that the most effective way? Are there programs that are that, while good in nature, they're not being effective? Where can we cut? Where can we cut some programs that are not being effective, right? Or maybe we need to do both, right? <laughs> Whatever the case may be, um, it's it's a good question, and eventually we're gonna have to answer this, eventually, because we can't just keep racking up debt so exponentially high that there's no way we can ever pay it. So how do we take care of it? What, what would you recommend? Let me know. And that concludes, actually, our lecture here. So what I would like to do here is, again, offer it, the opportunity here that if you have any questions, any concerns, any, uh, any thoughts you want to share with me, feel free to email me. Um, I'm always here to help. With that being said, we will catch you in the next video. Until then, peace.